Well, as you would know, um, not just in, in song, but in, in the Word, ministry of God's Word, uh, we have young people that are going to be sharing uh, this morning, uh, both this service and the next. And um, when we select young people to share, we, we look at their faithfulness, we look at their involvement, we look at their spirit. And each of the people involved this morning and to the next service have demonstrated wonderful attitudes, have demonstrated consistency and, and a spirit um, of loving the kingdom of God. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of introduce each of them now and then they're going to take the microphone one after the other. And I ask that you would just be with them as they share. Some are nervous, very nervous, but just get behind them and you're going to be blessed by the ministry this morning. So I'll go through each of them. Um, the first speaker we're going to have this morning is uh, Sister Amy Dunstan. Sister Amy Dunstan's a wonderful, wonderful young woman of God and has been such a rich blessing in our department and in our involvement of a Friday night. And we look forward to hearing her come and share and I'll bring her up in a moment. Uh, following that, we have a wonderful young lady called Sister My Lamb. Sister My Lamb, you would know, tremendous with the digital media. She's a very creative person. She does so much work for the church. So much of the growth of our online presence has been because of her wonderful ministry. But she has a word for the church this morning as well. So she'll come and share. And then our main speaker this morning, a wonderful young man of God, uh, Brother Anthony Canis, is going to come and share the word of God. And so I ask of you, that for each person that comes to share, you get behind them, um, encourage them. This is not a library, it's a Pentecostal church. You're allowed to say amen every now and then. So it brings me great delight to introduce to you this morning, Sister Amy Dunstan, the Minister of the Word of God. Let's give her a hand as she comes. by the opportunity out of all the young people that they chose me and yeah I'm just grateful um, I also want to give all the glory back to God everything I say this morning is for him and I wouldn't be here without him so for the next five or so minutes I just want to speak on the topic of comparison the Bible says in 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. And in the New King James Version, it finishes with, but they, comparing themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Using our own understanding and looking only to other people as a means of measuring ourselves is unwise in the eyes of God. However, avoiding comparison is much easier said than done. Comparison is literally in our nature. It's how we learn. The psychological theory of social learning shows that we learn by comparing ourselves to others and imitating the behaviours that they model for us. Comparing our actions and beliefs with other people is how we learn to interact with the world and interact with each other. So comparison can be useful, but it can also be detrimental. I'm sure we all know the famous quote by Theodore Roosevelt, comparison is the thief of joy. When we come to compare ourselves to others, their job, their prayer life, their relationship, their house, their social media. And if we come with an attitude of envy or insecurity, that's when it becomes harmful to us. As the Bible says in James 3.16, for when envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. By allowing envy to creep into our beliefs about ourselves in comparison to each other, we open our mental and spiritual health up to an array of harmful lies and beliefs. We start looking to others as our main source of identity, practically making an idol out of them, instead of looking to Jesus to tell us who we are and how we can become a better version of ourselves. As the initial passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians explained, it's unwise and without understanding if we use our own self-beliefs and our own opinions of each other as a way of measuring us. Instead, we're to look to Jesus. We should use his character as the basis of looking inward at who or where we currently are to know how we ought to change for the better, to glorify him and be more like him. Perhaps I'm only preaching a little bit to myself, but I know the comparison in the church is so tempting and so easy to do. You see some people being used by God so mightily and having such a clear calling over their lives, 
and you can almost not help but look back at yourself and feel less than. But God has a unique plan for each of us and each of our lives. What he's using one of his saints for won't necessarily be what he's calling you towards as well. An anointing or a blessing for someone else does not mean that your own blessing is forsaken. When we start comparing our personal walk with God to someone else's, we can be walking further away from where he is calling us to. Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. He knows each of us. He, knows, he knew us before we were even formed. And he has a unique plan for each of us. And we need not compare ourselves to anyone else. But all of this being said, there is no need for shame or condemnation for comparison. As I said earlier, it's in our nature, and to some extent, it can be helpful to us. But we need to make sure that we're not comparing ourselves to each other, but to Jesus. We've been given the ultimate instruction book for life through the Bible. And by looking more towards the Word of God, we learn more about Him. And we can use this as a mirror to look back at ourselves, not at each other. I encourage you today that if you're finding yourself comparing your life or your walk with someone else's, instead of allowing feelings of envy or jealousy to creep in, instead, use that as an opportunity to praise God for the way he is moving in that individual's life. Use, use how God has used them as an inspiration for your own walk and be encouraged by them, not envious. I pray that you truly understand an anointing or a blessing for someone else does not mean your blessing will never come or is forsaken. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and hold fast in the knowledge that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Thank you. I just like to thank God for this opportunity and of course to the leadership of Pastor Stan and Sister Robin and also you Pastor Greg and Sister Rachel as well. Um, my focus for this message comes from John chapter 14 verse 15. Here Jesus speaks to his disciples and says, if you love me, keep my commandments. First and foremost, our whole purpose in life is to worship and please God, to seek his face and know him intimately. And because we've all been made so differently, as Amy mentioned, we wonder in a practical sense, how can we fulfill this in our life? And I believe one of the ways is by knowing and honoring the word of God, also known as the Bible. And in that verse, God is saying that he knows you love him when you choose to obey what he has said to do in his word. And if you don't have that holy reverence towards his scriptures, then you're not going to keep his commandments and it reveals that you don't really love him mm. because if you really loved God you would seek his direction over every facet of your life in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 to 17 it says that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work and in Psalm 119 the psalmist says to God your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee and later goes on to say, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And while knowing this in mind, these verses to be true, our hearts can reveal when we don't really believe that. Because if we really believed that, then we would actively find ways in our day-to-day -day routine to treasure the word of God in our hearts. Um, a little while ago, I was pondering this question of, you know, what would be the first thing I would take with me if there was a fire? And I realized it would probably be things, you know, like my phone or my laptop, um, and my Bible wouldn't be the first thing on my list. And to me, that honestly made me feel a bit sad. And it just revealed to me that I didn't really love God as much as I thought I did. And, um, yeah, and I was actually comparing that to the hunger and desperation of people in countries who don't have access to the Bible. They really treasure it and don't take it for granted. They respect the word of God so much that, you know, they won't put their Bible on the floor or they won't put anything on top of it. They've placed physical Bibles in the foundations of their buildings or they've memorized entire books of the Bible because, you know, they'd be killed for being seen reading one. Wow. And it makes me think, um, you know, just like, wow, I wish I was like that. And it makes sense because, you know, the word of God is their daily bread and they need it to survive. 
and you know, I need it to survive, and we all need it to survive. Um, and there are several stories that really show the impact of having that kind of love and respect for God's commandments. In 2 Corinthians chapter 17, it describes that the Lord was with King Jehoshaphat because he sought God, walked in his commandments, and did not follow after foreign gods. In verse 6, it says that Jehoshaphat's heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. And we can see not only was he blessed, but also was his kingdom. In that chapter, he actively tells the princes and the Levites to teach the law of the Lord throughout Judah and to the people. And in verse 9, it says, And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. We can also look to Acts 6, where the early church was deciding on more leaders to help with the ministry. There was a criteria set for these leaders, which was that they were to be men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and those who gave themselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And once these men were selected and sent, it says that the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples increased, or multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. We can also look in Acts 8. Um, that chapter recounts how an Ethiopian eunuch was struggling to understand the scripture, and he asked the apostle Philip to help him. And the Bible says that from that scripture, Philip preached Jesus to him. And after hearing the word of God, the eunuch concludes that Jesus Christ is the son of God and was baptized immediately. In all these examples, we see that when the word of God is shared, there's always a positive outcome. Amen. In Jehoshaphat's case, peace in the land. In the book of Acts, more disciples who were obedient to God. And with the Ethiopian eunuch, his soul was saved. The Bible is life-changing. And just as um, John uh, chapter 14, verse 15 says, if we love God, we will obey his commandments. And how, we can know his command and how can we know his commandments unless we know the word of God? So my question to you is, how much do you really love the word of God? And what are you going to do about it? Praise the Lord, church. Just get set up here. Like the others mentioned, I'm very uh, thankful for the opportunity to share the word of God with you through our, our leadership. I thank the Lord for the opportunity. And, <clears throat> you know, it's such a privilege to share the word of God. Uh, the word of God changed my life. Amen. You know, when I was living in sin, living in the world, and one day, someone shared the gospel with me. And, you know, there's power in the word to give life. Right. Just like the seed comes from the man, gives physical life. So the word of God, Jesus said, is a seed. And there's power in the seed to give life. Yeah. Amen. Spiritual life. Yeah. Eternal life. Yeah. And how did Sarah conceive? Remember Sarah? How did she conceive? It said, Sarah received the power to conceive by faith. Right. Where does faith come from? Hearing. hearing. The word. Amen. Yeah. In the Greek, it says hearing the rima, or the spoken word. Yeah. Amen. When did Sarah receive this faith to conceive? Genesis 17, when God came to Abram, and he revealed himself as El Shaddai, as God Almighty. And he spoke to him and said, this time next year, I will visit you and your Sarah, your wife, shall conceive and bear a son. Sarah, uh, Abraham laughed himself, shall a man, you know, my age, you know, <laughs> conceive? But that's not when Sarah received the faith to conceive, because God was speaking to Abraham. If you read Genesis 18, the Lord visits Abraham again with three angels. And when the angels came to Abraham, they said, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent, you know, just behind us. And it said, Sarah was listening. And he said, this time next year, Sarah, your wife, shall conceive and bear a son. That's when Sarah receives the power to conceive through faith. Because she heard the word of God for herself. Amen. And we need to receive the word of God for ourselves in order for it to produce life and faith. Amen. We need a personal relationship with the Lord. Amen. Praise God.
And I'm thankful for the man of God, Michael, in my life who taught me the word of God. You know, when we come to the Lord, we're saved, we're born again, filled with the Spirit, it's great. And legally, we are saved. Amen. By grace, through faith, we are saved. We are, our names are written in heaven. But now we need to walk our salvation. Right. Now we need to renew our mind. Amen. And I'd come with questions. You know, Michael, what do you say about, what do you say about this? And he'd say, it's not what I say. What does Jesus say? <laughs> I say, okay. You know, a week later, Michael, what do you say about this? And he'd say, not what I say. What does the Bible say? <laughs> and this is the way our minds are renewed. Our minds are washed by the Word of God. Amen. And soon enough, it took time, but soon enough, when I had a question, I say, Lord, what do you say about this? And I open my Bible and the Lord speaks. Amen. He's a speaking God. He's alive. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So our reading today, but I'd also like to say, you know, applying the Word of God is difficult. It's challenging sometimes, especially when you come from the world. You have so many corrupt thoughts in your mind, philosophies, ways. I mean, it's different. It's contrary to the Word of God. Yeah. But that's why God's given us His Word. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says that we have to contend. Amen. And that's what I want to speak today from Jude, verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So the epistle of Jude, it's a general address to the church of his day, much like the New Testament, all the New Testament epistles are. But we know that all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for training, correction, training in righteousness, amen. So it applies to us. But within this letter of Jude, there, is a, there are special keys that indicate that is a, it is a specific address to the church of the last days. I'll give two examples. He refers to the people of his day as the same as the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We are living in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. He refers to them as the people that Enoch is prophesying of in the judgment of the second coming. And Enoch being a type of the raptured church who also declares the second coming of Christ. And so to our generation, the last day's church, the Spirit says, contend for the faith. Right. Amen. And I'd like us all to just join in prayer as we open the word. I believe the Lord has a good portion for us today. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word. I thank you for the privilege to share your word, Lord. Let it be your voice that is heard. Lord, let your word bless everyone that will hear your word today, Jesus. Anoint every heart, Lord. Open up hearts, open up minds to receive your Rima word, Lord. Let it bring life and faith and action, Lord Jesus. Let it bring victory in your people, I pray. Lord, I pray for your anointing. It's not me. Let it be you who speak, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So, our subject today is contending for the faith. Contending comes from the Greek word, agonizome. It means to struggle or to strive, as in an athletic contest or warfare, to contend as with an adversary. And so we know what we are contending for, contending for the faith, amen, the promise of God. But we must know how we are to contend and what we are contending against. 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. We can't be ignorant of his designs. Our focus should be the Lord, but we cannot be ignorant of his designs. Now, that Greek word, designs, it means the outcome of a person's mind, the purpose or the plans of one's mind. And so I'd just like to expose the enemy a little bit. Our fight, though, is not flesh and blood. Amen. To lay a foundation, in the beginning, God had rule over men and gave him dominion in the earth. And when the devil tempted Eve and she sinned, now the devil assumed the authority and rule over the earth and men. Just like when the devil's tempting Jesus and he said, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, to you, I will give this authority when he's tempting him and their glory, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. So the kingdoms of the world were given to Satan, 
But there's a partial truth there because we know it's only to whom and when whom God allows. Amen. He rules the kingdoms of men. Now, in Genesis 10, we are seeing the initiation of the kingdom of Babel. It was the first attempt at world conquest or world control. And we know that today we live in spiritual Babylon. And the enemy's plans haven't changed. So in Genesis 10, verse 8 and 10, we read, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and, and so on. Now, in verse 4, Gen sorry, Genesis 11, verse 4, Then they said, the people of Babel under Nimrod, Come, let us build ourselves a city with, its, with a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So we see Nimrod, who is the first type of the Antichrist. He was Gibor in Hebrew, which means a champion, a mighty man. He was also a mighty hunter. And this speaks of his military power. The beginning of his kingdom, the scripture says, was Babel. It was a great city. And kingdom speaks of government or his political authority, his political rule. Now, in this city... It had a tower with its top in the heavens. Heavens speaks of the dwelling place of God. And so they established religious rule, religious power. So the three distinct methods of control and power that rules the kingdom of Babel or Babylon is the military, the political, and the religious, which is what we see today. But the good news is that God is on the throne. Amen. And he will only allow a society to go so far from him. In Genesis 11:5, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. So when God, sorry, when man came to this place of power, when they are exalting themselves in the position of God, that's when God says, enough. He came to disperse them from the earth. In the same we see in Acts 12, when King Herod, the king, he puts on his royal garments and he comes before the people and he comes to give an oration to the people and they all start shouting out, the God, the voice of a God, not a man. And so he's receiving glory as a God. And it says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. In the same we see with King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, when he's one day, he's walking in, in the royal palace, you know, and he's looking out at the palace, and he says, isn't this my mighty palace, you know, that I've created for the glory of my majesty? He's exalting himself. And what happened? When the words were still in his mouth, it said, there fell a voice from heaven from the angel and said, Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom has departed from you. And he became like an animal for seven years. Because, he said... Until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Amen. And this is exactly what we see will happen with the Antichrist in the last days. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, ready, proclaiming himself to be God. Speaking of the Antichrist, exalting himself as God. Now, we know when this begins to happen, his end is near. Amen. Just like physical Babylon fell, so spiritual Babylon will fall too. Because God won't allow man to exalt himself to such degree. Our God is above all the kingdoms of men and has the only throne that is everlasting. Amen. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, speaking of the devil, you said in your heart, the devil said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. Now we're just exposing the motives now, we're exposing our enemy, then we're going to know how we're going to overcome him. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. The star, we are the stars, the children of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. I will. I will. 
I will, I will, I will. The devil is self-willed. He's full of pride. And he wants God's position over man. That was his goal from the very beginning. The devil has two ways of establishing this rule. Genesis 3.1, when he begins to talk to men. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God really say? So what is he doing? Takes away the commandment of God. Takes away the word of God from the people. Second, verse, verse 5, Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the second thing he does, he exalts man in the position of God. You will be like God. Pride. Job 41, 33 and 34. On earth there is not his like, a creature without fear. He sees everything that is high and he is king over all the sons of pride. That's the devil. The devil rules in an environment of lawlessness and pride. Now how he's achieving this plan, again, we're exposing him so we know how we're going to overcome him. Amen. Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, and you, speaking of us, the church, were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So because of sin, his spirit, the enemy's spirit, began working within us, within men, because of sin. Remember the story in 1 Kings, when... King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat, they're going to battle. And before they go, Ahab's a very ungodly king. He led Israel into much idolatry, much sin, led them far from God. And Jehoshaphat is a godly king. And he has some wisdom. And he says, let us, you know, consult the Lord first. So Ahab brings all his prophets, a room twice this size, 400 of them. And they all start prophesying, the Lord will give you the victory. The Lord will give you the victory. And so Jehoshaphat says to himself, mm, isn't there a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire? And he says, yeah, there's one guy, Micah, but he always says evil about me. He says, no, no, let not the king, so come on, bring him. And so anyway, long story short, they bring Micah, you know, one small guy, but he speaks to God. And he comes before them and he said, I saw a vision of the throne of God. And I saw all the counsel of heaven on his right hand and on his left. And God spoke to his heavenly council and said, who will go before me to entice Ahab to fall at Ramoth Gilead in the battle? And one said one thing, one said another. And they said, then I saw a spirit coming forward and said, I will go. And the Lord says, by what means? And he said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And so we see what's happening in heaven. But we see what's happening in earth now. All the prophets... They're prophesying, they're doing signs, they're going crazy, they're dancing. The Lord will give you the victory. But because they were worshippers of Baal, they were in sin, they were subjected to a lying spirit. And so that's how the enemy works. 2 Timothy 2.26, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, our society, Paul says, is under the prince of the power of the air. And his aim is two things. One, to remove God's law from the societies, God's word from the societies, and exalt man in the position of God. And that's what he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's the man of lawlessness. And he is exalting himself as God. And that is his motive, and that's what he's doing to achieve it. And this is what we experience every day in our workplace, in our school, in our communities, our society. They're trying to force us into his ways. They're trying to bring pride in the people, take away God's law, God's word from our hearts. But we need to contend. Amen. And we are going to know how we are to contend for the faith. Amen. Yes. So 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it, will do so until he is taken out of the way. So the restrainer is, will restrain until he is snatched away, which is the church. 
before the rapture. We will restrain the mystery of lawlessness. Amen. In verse, uh, so we read in Jude, Jude said, I'm appealing to you, contend for the faith. Verse 5, Jude verse 5, he's now giving them an example of the Old Testament church. He says, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that the Lord who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now, when did this happen? When they were standing before the promised land. God forgave them. God's full of mercy. But the problem with Israel is that they refused to contend because they saw the giants. Only two were willing to contend, Joshua and Caleb. And we need to contend. Amen. We need to fight. We are in a battle, but we need to fight. Amen. And the Lord will give us the victory. That's why we have his word. Amen. Verse 20 and 21 of Jude. Here's the key now. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Keep the love of God. This is the way to contend. Amen. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now remember when the Lord sent Joshua into the promised land. He was the one willing to contend, right? How did, how did the Lord instruct him to contend? Joshua, be strong, be courageous. I want you to do 50 push-ups a day. I want you to follow this. No. He said, keep my word. He said, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Then you will have success wherever you go. Amen. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night to be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will be prosperous and then you will have good success. Amen. He said, I've commanded you, be strong and courageous and do not be frightened. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. He said, be strong and courageous because it takes strength and courage to keep the word of God in our society. Amen. Paul is addressing Timothy, the pastor of Ephesus. And Ephesus is a very idolatrous city. It's the temple of Diana, much sexual immorality, much idolatry, much witchcraft, much paganism. And Timothy is a young man. He's pastoring this church amidst this culture. And what does, Timothy, uh, what does Paul say? He said, Timothy, fan into flame the gift that, I, that the Lord has given you through the laying on of my hands. Amen. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and self-control. This is how Timothy was to contend in Ephesus. Amen. This is how we contend today. We are to be the restraining force amidst our culture, the age of this world, and we need to maintain the fire. Amen. The love of God. Now, in my, in my workplace, when I, when I first started six years ago, there was a lot of gossip. I work in real estate, a lot of gossip, a lot of slander, uh, you know, rude talk, worldly radio, you know, pumping and everything. But I just came to the Lord. I was a new convert, but I kept the faith. I didn't hold up my Bible, you know, and preach to them. But whenever they started gossiping, you know, I'd start typing. You know, I'd resist, resist, resist. I told them I don't listen to worldly radio. I listen to worship. And I was made fun of, and it was very difficult at first. I was resisting. I told them I'm not intimate with my wife until my, until my wedding day. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, standing for the faith. And this changed the atmosphere. It was very difficult at first. But four years later, no more worldly radio music, no more gossip, no more slander, no more strife. Amen. Now there's teamwork. Amen. Now there's joy. My colleague's here. My new colleague. He, he's a witness. Amen. He's in church too. Praise the Lord. I had a meeting with my superiors and they told me, they sat me down. They told me, Anthony, if you can't even tell a white lie, you have no future in real estate. Six years later. Amen. Praise the Lord. We contend by keeping the word of God amidst our culture. And, you know, the night before Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus said, Lord, I'm willing to go with you to death. And I believe he meant it. Because when Jesus was being taken in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was the one that took the sword. 
sliced Malchus's ear and said, let's go, let's fight. The problem, though, is he was willing to do it in his flesh. He wasn't willing to go to the cross. And Jesus said, not this way. We are to die to ourselves. That's why Peter said, uh, Paul said, if you're willing to give up your life, but you don't have love, it's nothing. That's what he's requiring of us. It's the heart of submission to humble ourselves and do whatever the will of God is for any given situation. Amen. Jesus triumphed over Satan, not with the sword, but when he went to the cross and resisted every temptation that was brought to him. That's how we are to overcome. Amen. To resist him. This is our victory. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this if uh, the musicians will come. So my best friend who evangelized me uh, about eight years ago, we walked together, we were very close, and he began to teach me the things of God. He was from the Orthodox background, but he knew a bit of the Word of God. And one day, oh, when I, came, I started coming to this church two years later and uh, learned the Word, and I told him, I said, you know, I believe that God is one. And I believe that you need to be baptized for salvation. They don't believe this. And he looked at me, and he said, he pointed at me right in the face, and he said, re really close, he said, I rebuke you. That's blasphemy. And you know, that crushed me, because he's my best friend. And sometimes it's hard to contend, to contend, to stand for the faith. So I told Michael, you know, he said, pray for him. We started to pray. Six months later, I got a call. He said, Anthony, I'd like to see you. I said, okay. So we met up, we went for a coffee, and he said, you know, I've been thinking about what you said, and um, I believe if you make God three persons, then you make him three gods. So I think he, he's only one. I said, that's right, amen. And he said, you know, and also I've been thinking, and yeah, you, you do need to be baptized with faith for salvation. I said, praise the Lord, amen. So God works in the heart when you stand, when you contend, amen. Sometimes, though, it hurts to contend. Sometimes it hurts to stand when everyone else is against you. And, you know, I come from an Orthodox background. I believe, I don't know if there's many Greeks here, but 95% of the Orthodox who convert and born again will understand exactly what I'm talking about. My godparents, you know, the people that christened me at the time, uh, they found out, a very close relationship, 20 years, and uh, they found out I was baptized. And that's blasphemy in the Orthodox religion, right? If you get rebaptized. And they wanted to have a meeting with me. I said, it's okay. And so I met, I, I, met, I, I met with them, had dinner with them. And I started to tell them all the wonderful things about what the Lord has done in my life and how He's changed me. And I have love now. I don't do the drugs anymore. I'm not in sin anymore and everything. I've got a job. I'm, I'm engaged. I was engaged at the time. God's blessing my life. And again, <laughs> they look at me and they say, you don't change your religion. If you were my son, I would tell you to get out the door. That was it. They didn't come to my wedding. They haven't met my daughter. And sometimes it's hard and it hurts to contend. But as I was thinking about that testimony this week when I was preparing, the Lord reminded me. Remember when Stephen was giving his testimony before the, all the Pharisees? And he stood for the faith and he was alone. He stood alone. And they began to stone him. And the Lord showed him something. The Lord showed him a vision. And what did he see? It said, I saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. When you stand for the faith, God stands for you. He didn't see him sitting. Read the scripture. He wasn't sitting. He saw him standing. The Lord was standing for Stephen. Amen. Paul said at my first defense, when he was defending the gospel, he said, all deserted me, but the Lord stood by me. Amen. And when you contend, when you stand, the Lord stands for you.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand, please. We're going to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you are with us. We thank you that you have promised us every victory. Yes, we are standing before giants. We are standing before enemies, Lord, principalities and powers of darkness, Lord. But you have given us the key to our success, the word, your commandments, Lord, your spirit, your presence, Lord. I thank you that you've given us the tools and the keys to our victory. I thank you for the church. I thank you for the people, Lord, that pray for one another and share and encourage and bless one another. And I pray today, Lord, that you will release faith in someone's heart, Lord. I pray that you would release victory in someone's heart, Lord, for whoever is facing giants, whether it be at work, whether it be at school, in their communities, in their families, whatever giants they face, Lord, I pray for more grace. I pray, Lord, that you would visit them. I pray, Lord, that you will expand their hearts, expand their minds, Lord. May they receive, Lord, the victory within themselves. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, uh, one last thing. Pastor said I could call an altar call, and I was thinking about it. Because we're talking about the victory. Amen. Uh, you know, when God's army would go before, before their enemies, Judah would always go first. Amen. And Judah means praise. So if we want the victory in our situation, we need to praise. Amen. So if anyone would come to the front, wherever you are, I wonder if we could sing songs of praise. Amen. Sis, 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 do you think you could pray? We're going to sing a song of praise and victory. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.